call and I'll just go ahead. Talk she. Recorded live. Okay, welcome. This is uh this is Sunday, uh November the seventh, I believe, and tonight we have uh, Franco Collins who is going to come on and speak to us regarding uh trusts and trust structure. And uh Frank, so we really appreciate you being here and uh take it away, brother. Thank you very much. Look, firstly, I, I, I want to thank um, uh, Gary Ray and Michael Joseph and the other coordinators to invite me on to the call. Um, I've been most appreciative to be included on the emails that uh, Gary Ray has been sending out, and I just want to start by saying that I'm most impressed by the exchange and sharing of knowledge that this group has been doing and the work that this group has been doing, and I hope in my own way that I can assist in that, in what I know and sharing with you tonight. Uh, I may not be able to cover everything tonight <clears throat> because there is a fair amount of information which some of you may or may not uh, realise just by viewing some of the links that were included in the emails by uh, Gary Ray. But with that in mind, what I would like to do, and I hope I can do for all, all that are on the call tonight, is give some practical sharing and reference of information that hopefully sparks uh, both the, the idea and excitement in all of you that we are getting closer to knowing things better, but also that um, this might be an incentive for all of you uh, to continue to read uh, and investigate the links that uh, Gary Ray and Michael Joseph and others so gratefully have sent you. Uh, there's one other thing I just want to cover before I start, uh, and, and it, I think it's an important issue because I think it relates to a sensitivity uh, that, that we all, all share, and that's a sensitivity to the fact that we come uh, to this call, we come to exchange information with our own ideas, ideas that come from our parents, where we were brought up, how we're educated, um, what we've learned since, uh, and the trials and, and errors of life. And the reason I, I want to say uh, and pay tribute to each and every one of you in your own beliefs and the care that I, I sincerely take in respecting your beliefs is that I'm not here to, bake, uh, to break, not bake, to break anyone's belief system. I'm not here to disrespect anyone's particular opinion or ideas. In fact, I think part of the inhibition and part of the restriction to learning uh, in the past has been when uh, confronted with something that is so radical to our beliefs that our instant reaction, our natural reaction, uh, is to uh, be cautious. And so I, I want to pay tribute to all of you and your beliefs, and in particular beliefs that may share a common Christian value, uh, a, a common biblical value, uh, a, a common moral value, that I'm in no way here to challenge any of those beliefs, but to share with you what little I know in the hope that you can see how and why what should be uh, a life living in morals and peace and harmony has somehow been hijacked where we find ourselves today living virtually on a prison planet. So I know that's a long introduction and, and thank you for, for your patience. <clears throat> so I'm going to be referring now to uh, some work that I've done on the uh, uh, a thing called Positive Law, the Book of Positive Law. And I, I need to give a little bit of an introduction first before we get into it. But for all that uh, are on the call, I might ask you if you could please, the link that I'm about to talk to is one called one-heaven.org. That is uh, one with a dash and then the word heaven and then the uh, suffix.org. Uh, when you call it up, if you haven't been there already, you'll come to a... Uh, an image of a doorway and the words all welcome. If you click on all welcome, you'll come to a home page. And what I'm about to talk to you about is the third book of Divine Canon Laws. It's a link in the middle of the page there. 
under positive law. So I, I apologise for my accent and the number of words, but uh, if you get there, it, it is uh, 1-heaven.org, uh, and it's the canons of positive law. So before we get into specifics of positive law and talking about what truly is a trust, what is an estate, what are these founding concepts that are being used against us and are so important in understanding the present system of law. I need to explain why this has been written <clears throat> because I think this will help you all as well. Around about 492, 93 years ago, <clears throat> there was a fellow called Martin Luther. Uh, I, I hope and trust all on the call uh, are familiar with the name even if you're not familiar exactly with the story. But Martin Luther uh, is a significant figure and a relevant figure for our conversation tonight, for what he sought to do and the importance and understanding of, of what he sought to do. Uh, on All Hallows Eve, uh, we know as uh, now Halloween, on All Saints Day, Martin Luther used the symbolism of that particular day as being the day in which all souls may be uh, released uh, and may wander, a day of general amnesty, spiritual amnesty, to make a provocative statement to the Roman cult. <clears throat> uh, this is the Roman cult, otherwise known as the Holy See, otherwise known as the Vatican. So I can do the stupid phone for you. Yeah. Uh, are we okay or have we got a problem with the audio? Is that all right? Can you hear us? Okay, I just heard some people talking and I wasn't quite sure if you lost me, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, but on that day, what Martin Luther did was he nailed to the door of uh, a church, All Saints Church, his 95 Thesis. And that thesis challenged the underlying principles of the Roman cult, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, in claiming to control the world. Now, why was this so important at the time? <clears throat> in 1302, a pope by the name of Boniface issued one of the few authentic papal bulls that you can see today, most having already been corrupted, lost, and replaced. And that is the papal bull by the name of Unum Sanctum. That's U-N-U-M-S-A-N-C-T. I am, I believe, Bonum Sanctum of 1302, I think the, the date is. When that bull was issued, it's arguably the most infamous of the papal bulls. What makes that a significant document is it is, in fact, the first express trust deed. Uh, an express trust being a trust created by expressing a claim uh, in recognition of uh, rights, which we'll get into in a moment, what is rights, what is property, where the Roman cult claimed complete control of the earth, including all creatures, us being considered by the Roman cult as merely creatures. Now, contrary to the history that's been rewritten since that time, Martin Luther and many people throughout Europe uh, from original Catholicism considered this act an absolute act of bastardry, an act of, of uh, heresy, an act of supreme evil. And so he challenged the authority of the church. Now, the canon law that prevails at the moment uh, across the world is not the same canon law that was issued at the time of Martin Luther. In fact, the canon law that prevails the world today was written as recently as 1983. And I think a lot of people would find that surprising that the law that controls the world uh, is relatively recent. But what happened when the canon law was issued in 1983 is that there was no equivalent protest to the likes of Martin Luther. And I'm sure you're all aware that uh, he who does not assert his rights has none. It is a maxim in their system uh, that continues throughout their system uh, that says if you don't assert your rights, if you don't protest, then you agree, you consent. And this is precisely what uh, took place in 1983. 
So in 1983, the Roman cult issued its new canon law, where it made clear now, uh, clearer than ever before, uh, the nature of property rights, being the land uh, and the chattel attached to it, and chattel being included slaves and animals and creatures, which we are, uh, and persons, uh, persons being um, nobles, titled, uh, persons being uh, people who are considered uh, having some right in their system, a higher form of slave. In it, it was clear between juridic persons and things, uh, things being uh, not simply cargo, uh, but something that is contested, something that is controversial. For example, under the uh, work of uh, Pius um, at the beginning of the 20th century in the reconstitution of a thing called the uh, Sacred Rota or the Rota Romanum, uh, 12 apostolic proto-notaries were appointed, being the 12 apostles the figures that overlook St. Peter's. So that when uh, and a warrant, an arrest, a hearing, a summons, or any action is issued by the courts uh, in Canada, America, United Kingdom, Australia, or any country uh, that is using the pure form of Roman law, of which most countries are, then under canon law, uh, they are converting you into a thing if you never contest that hearing notice, that summons, that arrest warrant. Because by the definition, once a controversy has been accused against you and you hold no property rights, you automatically become a thing. So that before you even walk into one of their courts, you have absolutely no rights. And if you so dare to challenge them, then they will immediately move to apply maritime law. Mari, sea, timio, fear, fear of the sea, canon law. Maritime law is canon law. Using the canons of things to place you in a warehouse until the goods have been uh, clearly consigned or bond paid on those goods. So unless we challenge canon law, canon being rule, standard, norm, Unless we challenge canon law, then canon law stands for the earth. And it is no coincidence that since 1983, the conduct of the courts has become harder and more unjust uh, and, and more perverse and more evil. It's no coincidence because they have been trained now to their rights and powers by law. And that is precisely what the courts are doing. Common law is dead. It was killed in 1933 and it was well and truly buried by 1983 in the issuing of the latest canon law. So what we're about to talk about tonight is on behalf of us all our protest against the assertion that the Roman cult holds the supreme law that they may permit to treat us at, wor at best slaves, at worst dead cargo. This is why it's called canon law. This is why it has been written. And this is why it will be finished and promulgated and hopefully all will have a chance to read it and understand it. So that is the context of why we are issuing canon law. Okay. Now, the structure... Um, before again, I'm sorry for all this background, but it just gives people hopefully a context as to why this has been written. Uh, now I need to get into the structure of it. If you see things named in Latin, <clears throat> then I, I need to explain to you why uh, it, it's named in Latin. There is a prevailing maxim in all Roman courts, and virtually every court in the world is a Roman court, that a thing not named has no existence. Some of you may have heard this before, but the meaning of it may not be fully, um, fully there. A thing not named, in fact, is a thing not named in Latin. Uh, Latin uh, was uh, removed as a uh, spoken language and new languages created. But what happened with Latin is Latin became a reserved language, a higher form of language.